Hi. So about um, seven years ago, I had just moved back from Costa Rica where I was doing my master's degree in peace education. And I needed to finish writing my thesis, of which I had like four extensions because I'm slow at the thought. And um, I decided the best place to write my thesis would be in the Berkshire Mountains in upstate New York. So I board a train from Toronto to Albany, which is about like a 12-hour train ride. And I have all my books and my smart things and my laptop. And um, I, like I said, I'd been like in Costa Rica for a year studying, and it was the jungle. And so there wasn't a lot of romance happening in my life at that time. So on the train, I always feel like very kind of like whimsical and capable of magic on a train. I don't know if you all feel that. You do. <laughs> or you're laughing at me. Um, <laughs> so I think trains are great places to make wishes. And so I had a moment where I was just like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to pray. I'm going to pray for like the gods of hookups to like bring me a, a gentleman caller. And um, so I decided to do that. And it, the prayer was strong. And then I just went about my business. And I was writing my thesis and whatever, and hours pass. And then suddenly, like, the tallest drink of water you've ever seen walks on my train car. But like so tall and so beautiful. And he was like a, like a, just like a handsome man that the gods delivered to my train car. Um, and I was writing about, first of all, he had like this, like, um, he had a, like, a, like a vintage bag, a leather bag, and out of it was a baguette. So I thought that was beautiful. <laughs> and so he was sitting in like the next row, and I'm observing him, as sometimes I do. Sometimes I watch strangers and take notes about them, especially if they're handsome. I didn't plan on saying that, but now you know. <laughs> and I was sort of just watching him and writing about him on my computer, pretending I was writing my master's thesis. And, you know, then he pulls a jar of Nutella out of his bag and eats it with the baguette, which makes him think that he's my soulmate. And so that just happened. That, that happened. Eventually, we introduce ourselves to one another, and we start talking, and... It's, he's like an, yeah, what, did he, what did he do? He was like a wilderness man and a hunter and a stockbroker and everything you'd ever want in a train boyfriend. And um, he introduced himself to me and when he did, we, like, you know, we shook hands, but then he held on for a minute. It was just like barf, like it was so, it was so good. It was so charged. Anyways, we end up like talking and, you know, gazing, napping, making out other things, and um, so that happened in my life about seven years ago. And a longer version of that story, um, a less PG-13 version of that story, shall we say, is the, first, is the story that I told the first time I ever performed on stage. Um, and that, I saw this story is titled Strangers on a Train. It's a true story that happened to me in my life, which means, I mean, I have a great life, but, um, so I told that story on stage and at an event called, that was then called um, The Moth Up in Toronto, and the theme that night was love and sex, and somebody said, hey, you should go tell a story there, you, you got some stories, and you like talking in front of people, so I went, and I told this story to a room full of strangers, which was completely surprising to me, because I had such a blast. Like, I had told this story, obviously, to all of my friends always, because who wouldn't want to tell that story and hear that story, <laughs> right? Like, all the time. Um, and what happened to me that night is that I had this, like, alchemical experience with me and the microphone, whoops, oh, with me and the microphone and the audience. There was just this magic that occurred. And I experienced magic as an audience member as well. And it was so strange because I didn't understand why all these people were here to listen to true stories. And I just want to make a quick differentiation between, when I say storytelling, there is you know, what we think of as fables and mythology and oral traditions that get passed down from generation to generation. And I think that that is a really strong and important craft. It's not one that I really know about, but one that I enjoy. But what I'm talking about is this sort of contemporary storytelling movement that was really pioneered by an organization called The Moth. Um, oh, there we go. 
So it's called The Moth, and it started in New York. And their slogan is, True Stories Told Live. They have a very famous podcast. Thousands of people listen to it. They're satellite versions of The Moth all over the United States. Our Toronto version is called Raconteurs. And so the mission and the impulse behind this movement, really, is to tell true stories. And our Toronto rules are tell true stories that are yours, that are seven minutes or less. I always go over. Um, no stand-up and no props. My favorite rule is that it has to be your story. Because I hear amazing stories from people all the time, like, you know, from friends or family. Incredible things happen to us all the time. But I can't retell somebody else's incredible moment. I have to take the risk and tell my own and craft that into my own um, truth and narrative that I'm willing to share. And what's happening with this modern storytelling movement is that communities are being built around moments of truth and moments of catharsis and vulnerability. And what's also happened to me since I started telling a story, since I told that story and I continued to perform um, at other events and at the raconteurs is that it's become like a very minor local celebrity, like very minor. But what it means is that sometimes people spot me on the street. They're like, hey, I saw you tell a story at raconteurs. You're the girl that made out with that guy on the train, right? And I'm like, totally. And <laughs> it's my street cred. And but they come up and they're like, oh, one time I was traveling and I had this romance with this person and it didn't work out. It would, I hear stories from people all the time, strangers, that have either seen me on stage or seen me on the internet and they want to tell me what's happened to them, not just about making out with people on the train, like, you know, all kinds of other things. Often it's that. But there's, what happens is that because I made myself so vulnerable, because I don't always know what's going to happen when I have a microphone, sometimes I say things that I don't expect. And usually it's the truest version of what I planned to say. Like the microphone really strips me away from trying to be cooler than I'd like to. I'm trying to be cool, basically. So by me being willing to be uncool on stage, all these other people are willing to tell me their most personal moments. Then we have exchanges and we build community. And what was most fascinating to me about being learning about this community is that upon entering the first time when I, heard, when I went to tell that strangers on a train story at the bar, it was like a sea of hipsters in there. Everybody was like in plaid and glasses that looked like these and looked super cool and was like under 30 basically. And I was like, why are they all here? Like there's, this isn't a networking opportunity. There's no, you know, Toronto is built on like networking, collaboration, you know, forward thinking, making things happen. It's so active. Why are all these people here in this like seemingly passive environment? And it's because of this. <laughs> because we need community too. And we're building it. And this isn't meant to be like derogatory at all. Like, I don't really understand what hipster means, but I felt like this is true. There's, we, no matter who we are, our like most basic desire is to be heard in our truth. That's it. And everybody needs it, even in a big metropolis like Toronto where there's like endless opportunity for flirting and networking, which in the city I think happens together all the time and I find it very confusing. But at these events, you're just there to listen. Sometimes you flirt a little bit afterwards. But what the power of the community that we're building is that we're more interested, I think, when people show up here in the community that I witness and I'm a part of there, it's less based on technology and productivity and more based on something very personal and something that's empathetic and reciprocal. And the, when I realized the uniqueness of the community that I was becoming a part of was one night at Raconteurs when the theme, every night there's a theme and all the tellers have to tell a story based on that theme. The theme that night was the moment everything changed. So I was totally convinced that everybody was going to talk about the first time they had sex because that's really fun to talk about and listen to usually, but I was totally wrong. I was one of nine storytellers that night. Um, I was the only one who didn't tell a story about death, illness, or suicide of a close family member. It was an incredibly impactful night. You never really know what you're going to get when you show up at these events. And for some reason, this theme gave everyone this synchronistic moment to talk about something that is so not talked about. 
Um, I found it really, really fascinating, really humbling. It was really hard then to go tell my story that night, but my story that night was about how telling the story about a stranger on a train changed my life, which it really did. But that night, hearing people reveal such raw truths and moments and losses and fears that they had, and these weren't all performers, you know, these are just like regular people. And they decided for whatever reason to take a risk that night. And it really brought the house down. Usually people do stay and flirt and drink afterwards. People cleared out right away. And for me, what was so powerful about that night is like it was a response, I think, to a call that a lot of us have. I used to work um, as a chaplain in Montreal at a hospital. And my job was to essentially spiritually accompany people at the end of their lives and their families. So for me, talking about death and illness and mental illness and what happens to our communities when we experience these things is of like utmost importance and we don't do it. We just don't talk about it. And somehow, by accident, all of the, these people who showed up that night decided this is what they needed to speak about. So for me, it was real evidence of the uniqueness of what true storytelling can do. It can build trust and safeness and building a space for people to feel safe, to, you know, be foolish and funny and really sad and really in mourning. Um, and that night I did speak about how the story Strangers on a cha Train changed my life, not only because I'm a minor local celebrity, but because since then I've been asked to tell stories at all different kinds of events. And in Toronto there's a different storytelling events based on themes. There's one all about secrets. There's one about awkward moments, which is really fun. But I'm seeing that all different kinds of people, not just people with like tortoise frame glasses. There's, we all are interested in hearing each other's stories and telling them. So then there's Facebook that asks us to tell stories that are true, I think, because it says, hey, Ariane, how are you doing today? And I'm just like, you know what, Facebook? Like, I don't know if I want to tell you how I'm doing today. How true am I supposed to be? When I tell stories on stage, I end up being, and this is my like mathematical theory, that I'm 97% true. Which, by the way, the Strangers on a Train story, 100% true. Um, but sometimes I need to withhold a few percentages to protect myself or to keep a veil up or to be professional or not offend someone. But Facebook asked me this, and it's this tool that kind of disconnects us from each other, and there's been lots of writing and I'm sure lots of talks about that, but I think it's important to note, because we're interacting with these things all the, all the time, all day long, that assume that we're going to tell them the truth about what it is we're feeling, when this is actually how I'm feeling, probably with more swear words. But, you know, am I going to put that on my Facebook status? Am I going to allow my whole professional and personal network to know that I'm completely a vulnerable, nervous mess before giving a talk? Probably not. I mean, maybe. It would be a good experiment, but I'm not quite there yet. So I think that part of what this points to is our, all the people that come to these storytelling events, I'm guessing most of them have some kind of social media account. But they come, they put their phones away, and they listen. It's because we need it. We're desperate for it, and it, it's working. There's lineups out the door for storytelling events. That you know, The Moth in New York, the lineup when I went was around two blocks. <coughs> Excuse me. People are thirsty for it, and it makes them feel connected. So when I think about how we're going to change the world, and I think about my degree at UPS, which I thought would really help with that, I found out that what changes the world for me is this. It's like really, really basic. How can I learn to tell the truth more? For whatever reason, I've figured out that I can do that on a stage in front of 100 strangers. It's highly confusing to me because I don't do it all that well in my personal life, but I'm working on it. That's my challenge. My challenge to you and my request and my invitation is that, you know, if you're here, it's because you're interested in new ideas and how they can change systems or moments that we feel are in disharmony. The way that I think we can bring more harmony in is by telling more true stories. Tell them to yourselves, to the people in your life, to your communities. I believe this can also change our cities, the way that we interact with them, the way that we're in love, the way that we're in anger. And it's a challenge, but it's a really great one because it's messy and strange and really fulfilling. 
And there's something about sharing these moments publicly that has been very powerful for me, but I understand that's not everybody's mode. And about three years ago, I started working on a project called Love Letters to a Friend, where I've been collecting love letters from all different kinds of people. There, some are really funny, some are angry, some are lustful, and they're not all about romance. I got a love letter submission that was a love letter to a cow from somebody that lived on a farm because they really loved their cows, which I totally love. One of the favorite love letters that I've written, I was given an assignment by a storyteller to write vows. Um, so I wrote vows to the city of Montreal, which is, so I wed the city, um, and it's a nice union so far because I was honest in the letter. And so I've been collecting these love letters, and for me, I've become a sort of accidental archivist. And I wonder sometimes, I was thinking about it this morning, how lucky I am that hundreds of people have given me their most precious moments, and then I realize I'm not lucky. I mean, I, I totally am, but they just, I, I just asked. I just said, hey, you wanna submit your love letter to me? And people say yes. So you just have to ask for truth and it comes back to you. So I think there's a couple ways that we can tell true stories. Now, one of them is to write a love letter. I encourage you to do it. Write one to yourself, to your friend, to your cow, if you have a cow, or you know, any, they're all around us, they're available to you. And you don't have to send it. I believe in the unsent love letter as well, but maybe you'll take a risk and send it. But just write it. And the other way, as we heard from our host, is that you can tweet stories. This is not something I'm familiar with yet, but I'm working on it. The Twitter, short form. I tend to be a bit verbose. But you're going to hear so many incredible stories today, and I really encourage you to share those. And in small moments and big moments, just keep sharing them. And that's it. This is where you can find me on the internet. And thank you so much for listening to my stories, and I hope to hear yours today as well. Thanks.